Greetings. Hi, everyone. Hey, Tal. Hello, good morning. Hello, Victor. I've dropped a link to the meeting notes. Uh, if you can add your name and if you have a topic you'd like to go over, add it to the meeting notes. Or if you're having trouble accessing the Zoom doc, you can either speak it or drop it in the Zoom chat. All right. We can get started. Um, Google Docs is running. Actually, everything's running a little slow. If you didn't see it, there's a link to the meeting notes and the Zoom chat reposted. Does anyone have a, any items to add to the agenda for today? Are we going to review the, the last tribulation? Um, white paper that we did last week? Um, are you referring to the tag security white paper? No, the Google Doc uh, white paper. The, um, oh, the, uh, the less, princi less privilege. principle of least privilege? Yeah, that one. All right. Um, we can take a look at it. I think that maybe be a follow up to. We still have some pull request open. And I'm going to add a related paper from Tag Security and uh, the Kubern uh, CNCF Tag Security. Come on. Um, format. Clear formatting. There we go. Link. All right, anything else? To add? 
All right. I'm bringing that one up. Um, so this, this is the, it's at notes and I guess the start of um, what could be some papers or, and or use cases around least pr the principle of least privilege and security in general. Um, probably um, would go into a lot of different practices and supplemental papers that we could go into. Um, so that's linked there for this. If, if you don't have, uh, you should have access to the working group. So this link is uh, from the working group notes. And Ian went uh, through this last week somewhat. And we've had a, a bit of uh, some comments and stuff added. So this whole uh, document here is can be used as reference material. Anyone in the community that wants to go and um, use this. Uh, we don't have a specific license, but I think if it was going to drop in, it would be tied with the same on the repo, a Creative Commons license to cover. But essentially, this is a a large chunk of reference material around security related things. Um, at least privilege was one of the comments or one of the areas. And then that got down into more specific things like the no root and container. So why do we want to do that? But it covers a lot of other things. And the top part is to try to get something closer to whether it's a write-up like a white paper or a, you know, whatever we want, blog, or just the supplemental stuff like in use cases. Um, let's see. So some of these sections, I don't know who all was last week. So this may be review for you. Um, but the first part is why are we doing this? What is the problem? Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring up the... Let's see, I, I've lost the paper out, oh, here it is. This is a good um, reference that we didn't go over before uh, Ian and I were working on all of this content, but there's a lot of overlap in this. So the tag security white paper, um, which is written by folks that are, helping involved in running the security um, group, including people from like Falco or Sysdig, who that's what they do. Like their expertise in, is in security. Um, the, there's some people I've seen in the group like from OPA, so the Open Policy Agent and other groups. So they're sharing a lot of their experience um, with this and they do have a section on least privilege if i can find it again uh, let's see least privilege there we go i think i've already linked this section So they're, they're talking about this. This is building up on a lot of other areas. The zero trust architecture, which Frederick, um, he's talked about in this group and other places a lot, zero trust architecture. But this is building on all of the other security principles and practices that they're talking about. And they go into authentication, authorization. Um, so one of the areas in Kubernetes that we haven't talked about, but could be talking about using RBAC. Um, so role-based authorization and control. And there's a lot of stuff out there on that. Um, there's books about it. 
there's videos you can watch, but talking about using roles to limit um, access for both machines and as well as uh, real people that are maybe manually interacting. So that's uh, part of this. Um, so the account layer down, they're going into that, but they're saying every stack, every layer of the stack, you should be doing it. Um, talk about rootless services and containers. So this was one of our focuses. Um, trying to stop access between containers and host and multiple, you know, multiple containers and other things. And then the um, roles and namespaces aspect of this, as far as privileged access, uh, can limit that type of problems. And then you have um, ways that you could implement this, which you can see if you're doing custom implementations or if you're using a, a, a cloud or a, a service um, based place like um, OpenShift has by default limited access on privileges. They enable that. There's a lot of stuff built in going through from um, RHEL, if, if you're familiar with all of that history, building up into the OpenShift to, to be secure. And there, you're starting to see that in other places um, by default. And um, there's a lot of stuff going into Azure around this. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole white paper right now. It's pretty huge. But if uh, folks want to point something out on this one, we could jump into that and focus on a particular area. I'm going to switch back to the working session notes because we had some other comments. So one of the things that um, we're trying to cover in content, not to say that it's going to be in a specific use case that we may write up first, but we'll want to have it available somewhere. So it could be supplemental, it could be somewhere else's. Where do we start having problems um, with privilege, need, the need for privileges? Why do we want privilege? So we have some stuff here and you can see similar things if we go and look at other uh, reference material. And, and the areas, but performance, networking, Tal um, put in some other areas where um, there may be a, a need to have privilege or why it might be used. Um, and then ha the, the question then is, is there something where there's already something in the works to make it a native part of um, I guess the ecosystem to be able to access those resources. So NUMA access, well, that's about um, trying to be specific with the memory allocation. And there is stuff in the works. If you look at, I think it was like V118 forward in the um, Kubernetes trying to continue to move forward as far as being able to request access to those. Um, in the networking domain, fine-grained access is usually desired and necessary. In the CNF test bed itself, we've done a lot of stuff where we've gone in and, and various tests to expand beyond what Kubernetes capabilities to do, CPU pinning, NumaZone, um, alignment and other things, um, but those things seem to be growing. And then you got a bunch of other areas, um, special, uh, it's just hardware resource. What we're talking about is if you have resources and you want access to something, then how do you ask for that? And if there's not a way to ask for it in a let's say Kubernetes native potentially, but also without asking for privileges, then this might be an exception. And what we don't get into here, but I think what you could find in the tag white paper and in other places are when you're giving something privileged to try to isolate that one thing from all the other components, even in your own application. 
Uh, Victor, did you have any specific areas that you wanted to focus on out of this session, Doc? Or I, I do know that you put this area here that you thought was important. Well, yeah, I, basically, I guess that's, that is one of my uh, comments. Uh, in, in overall, I consider the document is fine. Um, so let's see that that comment just express the the order of the ideas, but I mean that doesn't change too much. Um, I I want to add another small point, or maybe a big point, <laughs> in response to uh, to what Taylor just said. Um, it, it's really interesting. Things like Numa, for example, are getting protected ways to request access in Kubernetes. They already have it. Um, it, it would be interesting, right? A, a lot of our issue here with uh, uh, privileges is exactly that paragraph that Victor uh, highlighted. Um, we need to do things. And the only way apparently to do those things is with privilege. So we're suggesting, well, don't do those things, do other things. But if you, if you look at the history of container technologies, right now we're basically using LXC the very fact that we can access, for example, uh, network interfaces in a safe way is because the container uh, safeguards that, right? Uh, using Linux uh, namespaces and, net and networking, it, it allows you to access an interface in a safe way without accessing anything else. There could be technologies in the future that would allow the same kind of uh, namespacing perhaps or similar for other, all the list of technologies that I put there, right? For example, access to a GPU could be done in a safe way, potentially without um, uh, requiring privileges, right? Or an FPGA or similar. So my, my point here to say is that there's, to an extent, all of this has been black and white, right? We're saying either you need privileges, you don't have a choice. So then you have two options, either find an alternative or you know, we're stuck. <laughs> You're going to need privileges, but the platform itself can improve. The containerization technologies can improve in such a way that you will have uh, safe ways to, to access these technologies. Um, yeah. Something you can work towards. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that was kind of the point I was trying to make that by this, it's not the principle of no privilege. It is the principle of no privileged flag because the privilege flag is not fine grained. And so it gives you a lot more privilege than you need to get your job done. And the rest of the privilege is really quite dangerous. Um, so yeah, exactly the point that you're saying here is that uh, the reason we run into problems with privilege is in fact, because the level of privilege we can request is not precisely what we need. It's not the least privilege that you need to get the job done. It's actually much greater than that at this point in time. But yeah, I, I absolutely agree that the point was not to say you should never use expanded privileges. You should never have the right to use, you know, to ask for memory on your Numa node. You should never have the right to uh, change networking in a certain way. It's, it is that if that's the thing you want to do, you should be delegated exactly the rights you're looking for and no more. Another right, way where... of saying it is, I, I think that having privilege could be the least privilege it's you're trying to get something done and you're saying within the environment that we're in granted the least privilege needed to get your job done if there are no other options except giving full privileges then you get full privileges and then we have other practices to say how do we safeguard against anything, including something that's partially privileged, but definitely for full privilege. But there, there, there's never anything that is, we're, we're not, or, uh, to go with what Ian said, we are not explicitly saying you never can break a best practice. Anyone can always say that practice doesn't work for me. Mm. Our job is to try yeah. to help people see the practices that are communicated by the community as good practices to try to follow so that you can know. And then how do you use them? Uh, exactly. 
I think we had uh, a, an idea before that if you have to use privileges, then don't let the entire application use high privileges, only this, the part that needs, like the part that needs to create the, the, the raw socket or whatever. So only that pod may, may use privileges, but um, the rest of your application shouldn't do it. I mean, once something cannot be met, it's not a reason to throw the entire best practice out the window. We can mitigate for that and kind of contain the, the exception. Right, Ronnie, you actually expressed a best practice, which is isolate privilege. That is the best practice. So one thing we should also call well, out as well, if, if we haven't already, is uh, to also state what those privileges are because it's it's one thing to say, oh, I have privileges. It's like, okay, we understand that your application is going to need some additional privileges. But if I don't know what those privileges, uh, what, what those privileges are, uh, or uh, my application by default installs those additional privileges without letting me know as part of the installer, then that puts me at risk. And so we want to make sure that we're also forthcoming, that we're using additional privileges, and that helps the operator determine how they want to defend the, the system. Like if you need full privileges on a cluster, then and and I know that it needs full privileges and that the installer is going to do that, then I may make a decision to mitigate it by installing it on its on an isolated cluster where it cannot affect other applications. So it's just as an example. I think Taylor, something to add to practices too, as another one is the concept of like relinquishing privileges. I mean, we keep having these same like discussions, even though we keep calling out, it's not a zero sum game, right? It's a scale. So the least amount of privilege to get what you need done could be that you have maximum privilege. I mean, you are root, right? Like it's a scale and maybe we haven't like articulated that enough, you know, in like the intro paragraphs and stuff, but I mean, the best practice is you give the least amount of privilege you need to get the job done. That's, you know, different than isolating privileges. That's different than relinquishing privileges you don't need after you have it. So we probably need more best practices, but it's not a zero sum game. I mean, if the only way you can get what you want done is through maximum privilege, that's where some of the other practices now that are being listed also help us, right? Like you have maximum privilege because that's what's required but it's isolated to where you need it, right? I mean, it's typical like CISSP type stuff of like understanding like the domains where you're doing, you know, presenting from like horizontal attacks, insider threats, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, you know, this is just one practice and like basically like we could call it like a suite of security best practices. So then obviously we want to look at that white paper from the tag, but like we just, we have to like, we always get into these like debates on like, well, I'm going to have to have this. Well, that's fine. That's still meet. That's not even violating the least pr privilege practice that is just saying that the least amount of privilege I need is maximum privilege. It's not like a, a zero sum game in this regard. Yeah, I, I think um, at least for some of these privileges, the problem of having the privilege is not that it's the least privilege you have. It's that it breaks the boundary between platform and application, which is a technically different thing than um, having the least privilege necessary. I mean, even if every privilege was completely secure it didn't threaten the stability of the platform or other applications it would still be a logical thing again right routing containers is a matter of least privilege because it makes your application better but having root in a container absolutely does not mean that you can step outside of your container it's a perfectly safe privilege to have from that regard the problem with something like capsis admin which is so necessary for a lot of the things that we'd want to do in networking really the only option we've got for ourselves today is that it can potentially lead to the platform becoming broken by an application, which I think it's fair to say in a cloud environment, the platform should never be endangered by any application running on it. So, uh, well, another, I think uh... one thing that's lost in security though is everything is about you know risk avoidance, risk acceptance, like you know risk analysis. Like to say that you're going to be in a completely risk-free world is never going to be the reality. So, I mean, there's always going to be compromises somewhere, right? Well, kind of. I mean, if you look at a standard Unix process, for instance, that isn't running as root, then 99% of standard using Unix processes not running as root can do their job. And even that even includes ones that use 
certain levels of privilege because you use a separate process where you ask for precisely what you want and it goes and asks for the kernel to do the thing that you're in need of doing. So there are examples of managing privileges, even when the privileges are not necessarily terribly fine grained. Right, I'll, I'll add here another practice that we can consider is using SC Linux. Um, you could, I, I don't know exactly how to do this. SC Linux is pretty complex, but I wonder how it can support limiting specific containers, right? Because if you have a specific user, well, if, if you do have a privileged container running under cryo Kubernetes, potentially you can use SC Linux on the host to make sure that you limit the limit what it can do. So even though you requested privilege, um, you're still limited because of uh, uh, that user. Not quite sure how to do that in SC Linux, but pretty sure it's you could, and it's probably something worth uh, worth looking into. Uh, I, I do want to add just another point to my <laughs> earlier point about um, you know things changing in Kubernetes. We need a qualifier for all of these uh, with a version saying. This is our best advice. These are the best practices considering, considering Kubernetes 1.20 cryo with, with this version because future versions might indeed uh, improve uh, the fine grain control that we have. So right now we're just doing best practices, but it's, it's frozen in a moment in time in which these are the capabilities that the platform has. I think it's, that, that one's even bigger than that because it's going to be Kubernetes with these add-ons and per the previous conversation about SCPP, potentially also with certain kernel modules loaded. Uh, that, that's exactly true. So I'm just uh, putting a note to us that we need to make sure that we're qualifying all our best practices really with versions or, or by date, <laughs> if that's easier. I don't, just I don't to... think they're going to all need, need them, but where, where needed, we can specify that. The other thing the, right. to remember is all of them can be updated. So when we come in and look, that's if things change, then we're going to update. The run processes as non-root is older than Kubernetes. That that one. When we're saying run with privilege equals false by default, that's a Kubernetes specific flag. We, Privilege flag equals false. Probably should say that. I wish I had right. a different name. The, um, the thing relinquishing about relinquishing privileges, relinquish, relinquishing privileges. As soon as you've done the work, what um, Jeffrey was putting forward, that's generic. That should be applicable outside of Kubernetes. It's a it's a security practice that's older than Kubernetes. Probably older than mm. OpenStack. True, but a best practice would presumably detail how you do that within Kubernetes in a way that someone can, you know, verify that you've done it as well. Agreed. Anytime I, I we think, reference, um, anytime we reference specific things, we can do that. So that the SC Linux thing that you were talking about before, um, Tal, um, there's a whole page about that with under the Kubernetes docs for use in security context. And you can tie it in with different systems that can do those type of things for um, escalation and access control um, that you can, you can do this. So if we're going to actually talk about implementation a specific, whether that's an example in a best practice, or supplemental material where we say, here's how to apply this um, principle, this practice using SE Linux, then yes, we can give versions. I want to uh, just really quick piggyback off of something Ian said though. It's not just from the context of Kubernetes, this is the CNF working group. Um, so we should be, you know, coming in with the bias of how this best practice applies to like, you know, the container networking world and like running CNS, right? Because what we don't want to do is just rehash a bunch of stuff that like security experts and other groups have already written, right? Um, like 
I mean, there's plenty of examples when you start getting into weird things like ONAP or other stuff where like, does this container need to like indefinitely just maintain and hold privileges? Like just, I just want to throw out the caveat that we make sure that we keep this relevant specifically to what this working group is set out to achieve. And we're not just writing, you know, best practices that are just generic to Kubernetes because those probably are listed somewhere already. Right, we, we talked about this a bit last week. Um, I think what we need to do is at least create a list that we think is important, but we don't have to detail. If there are other documents that do a better job, we should just reference them, but we can at least collate all those documents in, in our own best practice. Um, so the, the list that we created here of practices is great, and some of them could be detailed or some of them can just refer you to something else or we might be able to summarize it in a way that's uh, convenient. And I do think looking at that white paper and I apologize because I've been out for medical reasons, I'm catching up, but like there's a lot of like content that is specific to the CNF. So then it's, this is also with us, you know, trying to get some best practices just going because we were all sick of admin stuff. But like, this is also where I'm, tying best practices to the use cases, you know, will also kind of alleviate a lot of this stuff. Cause if we have a use case that's specific to our genre here that we are, you know, we care about, and then the best practices are drafted from the standpoint of how are we, you know, satisfying these use cases. I think some of this will just happen organically, but just throwing it out there. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point as well. Like the, many of the CNFs use uh, esoteric protocols and it would be interesting in time, like we talk about least privileges, but what, what does that mean in the context of SCTP? Or if I have to run one of the, uh, the 5G uh, user playing uh, tunneling protocols, then like what, what does, how, how do the best practices that we have also apply to, to those particular environments as, as well? And like this, it's also a two-way street. So if we generate information that ideally is useful in the creation of your CNFs. We also generate information that could eventually go back to SIG network or SIG security or, uh, or other organizations within Kubernetes that uh, we could say, these are the things that work for us. These are the things that don't work for us. And here's the things that we had to relax in order to allow this through that we love to have something more fine green if, if it's possible. It's, yeah, I mean, the, the primary example of that might be service meshes, which generally have privileged sidecars um, because they're doing what we're doing, right? They're trying to do things with networking that were never originally conceived of. And the only way they can do that is over step boundaries that have been set in stone with, you know, very blunt instruments to get around to them. And um, yeah, uh, that would be one place I think where if we came up with a best practice that suited some of our needs then we probably find that best practice was useful to others and there's a lot of other topics as well that we that we should also take a look at like what are we doing in terms of uh, in terms of placement as an example because some of the workloads are latency sensitive and so how do we how do we make sure that the cnfs are designed to make use of that placement and what can they what can they use in order to uh, in order to ensure that or what are the limitations because there are some limitations in, in how that placement works mm. That, that one's interesting. Um, I think there's a whole category of things here where the knobs we've been given or that we're creating or recreating in some of the cases where we're basically borrowing out stack technologies are largely knobs for this will make things run faster, not this will make things run fast enough. Latency kind of fits into that as well, because if we're talking network latency, then we can say, well, if you put these two things on the same host, it will run faster. But in actual fact, we don't want it to run faster. We want it to run fast enough, which is a guarantee, not a, you know, not a best effort thing. So how far we can take that in the future is an interesting question, but we have to bear in mind that again, tweaking placement to put two things on the same host, which is the easy thing to do, is not actually what we want. It's just a step in the right direction, one step. 
Yeah, and also at, at what cost? I may place two workloads on the same host and I, I lose something else where there's contention there. Uh, or one of the processes, uh, like it's very common for data planes to, to burn a core. And so uh, what does placement look like at, at that point? And so it's, it's not just the, what can you do, but also what are, the, what are the limitations so that when people are designing and architecting these systems up front, they're designing to not just what do we want to do, but what, what are those boundaries that we cannot get across? And bringing it back to the con to context of least privileges, uh, the uh, privileges that are there are not very fine grained. Like they're, they're better than they used to be. And when you bring in things, so when we start bringing in things like uh, the capabilities, like well, we're definitely gonna give too many capabilities with, uh, with some of the flags that are there. So one of the things that would be interesting would be to say, this is where we are and if we want to do a deep dive into one of these topics, we could say, how do we apply something like, uh, like EBPF through Falco or something else in order to further constrain this thing so that you can work around the limitations of, uh, of Kubernetes and, uh, or to be more precise, the limitations of the Linux kernel itself uh, that uh, Kubernetes, of the features that Kubernetes itself makes use of. And so I, I think that there's I, I think that there's some interesting things there that we could that we could drive on on a deep dive, but we need to start off with like this is the stick in the ground, this is the least privileges, which I think you've done a, a good job with here. Well, let's talk about what best practices we could have in the current situation. So I think <clears throat> it would be fair to say that things should not be running with privilege. They should be running with specific capabilities, as an example. By yeah, privilege, and, you mean you may are you saying in the the flag, the con the container flag, or running? Yeah, so we're, we're not talking okay. about privilege. True, we're talking about never do that. Always list your specific um, capabilities that you're looking for, and then always constrain it to the minimum set you need to get your job done. I mean, because as a best practice, that has, as far as I can see, no exceptions, right? There is no reason not to do that. You can always get your job done if you do it that way. Yeah, and taking it back to what Tal mentioned as well about what are the additional things that you can add on? Like, is there, like, I install this, this particular CNF, I create a CNF, and it takes the least number of privileges, it's still insecure. Like maybe it's using uh, uh, CapNet raw. And I can, if someone breaks into the system or into that specific uh, service, then there's a whole set of things they can do there. So what can I do to further constrain? I may be able to do something on the SE Linux side, or maybe there's something I can do on the EBPF side or the data plane that it connects to based upon the, uh, the interface that it has access to. Uh, the data plane can constrain in certain ways. And so there's, there's things that uh, we need to be able to, to raise to say that it's like these privileges are a great start. They're not enough. You can further constrain and fine tune using these additional things in order to, in order to further mitigate them. Yeah, so um, CapNet Cat Roar is an example, probably dangerous on an interface that your average system grade um, CNI provides you on the grounds that it's not going to expect you to be able to do most of the things that CapNet Raw hasn't been designed for you to do most of the things that CapNet Raw lets you do. On the other hand, probably perfectly healthy on an interface that you're getting from some secondary CNI through Maltus, um, but very, very difficult to narrow down when it is and it is not acceptable. So it's not just that it's clearly a good or a bad practice to use CapNet Raw, it's that it's really not possible to express a best practice when CapNet Raw is laid on the table the way it is today. Yeah, and it's default on for, for those that are uh, unfamiliar. So by default, and the reason it's on is because in order to respond, not even 
make a ping outward, outwards, but literally to respond to a ping, your container needs capnet raw. And so the default is to enable it. And this has been the source of multiple types of attacks, such as uh, R poisoning, DNS poisoning, and similar, which, uh, which lead to more complex attacks over, over time. So we want to be able to, to say, if you're building a CNF and we expect these CNFs to, uh, to live in places that are sensitive potentially, then like, you're gonna have CapNet raw almost certainly, uh, it'll certainly on my default. Here, uh, so we're not, we're still not following, like we're closer to the, to the principle of least privileges because we're not like giving you a CapNet admin, but it's still, there's still things you can do to further protect yourself. And here are, ex here are some examples of, of how you can, of how you can do that. And I think something like that on a concrete side would, would go a long way. Yeah. So, so one answer to that is uh, using a product like Cilium. Uh, Cilium takes over all your networking and implements its own uh, uh, security layer there. I don't know specifically if it, it could protect, protect you against those attacks, but it definitely can protect it uh, against a lot. So that's another potential, uh, maybe something we could add to the list, consider Cilium or similar products. Uh, also another uh, practice we forgot to add to the list is um, virtualization. That, that's another a potential solution to these problems. You could use a full-blown virtual machine with Qbert or Kata containers or something else that provides better protection than containerization. I think that both of those solutions slightly miss the point because the, the issue we run into with using something like CapNet Raw is not um, that you can do dangerous things with raw packets. It's that there is an unwritten contract between the workload that you are and the network that you're attached to that says you will use the network in these ways. So for any, for an unspecified CNI, that contract might include, well, you won't have CapNet Raw, so it's not a thing we need to defend against. For Cilium, it may not be true, right? And for what it's worth, Cilium does what any other CNI could do if it chose to do as well. There's not anything particularly special about Cilium, but, um, it amounts to if I, the workload, start sending, you know, random art packets because I feel like it, and you, the network, start ending up with a poisoned art cache because you're not expecting that, then that's where the problem comes in. It, it isn't use technology X. It is have expectations that are agreed on both sides. Yeah, or run um, in promiscuous uh, mode and, and capture, uh, capture packets that you weren't expecting to to have access to as well uh, but yeah. that's besides the point like in, in terms of like we we identified a particular problem we have with with uh capnet raw uh there are multiple mitigations uh, mitigations can include virtualization you could run something that's evpf uh, that further filters it down which is what selenium does or you could you could run this in user space uh, networking where you're not using the, the kernel mechanism there. You're like, yeah. if you're using something like SRILV in direct mode, then none of this applies. It's all up to your, your data plane at that point. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And that's my point. It, it doesn't matter what you're attached to because I could be attached to the kernel and make this work. I could be attached to the top of rack switch with a VF and it would make this work. It matters that expectations are the same on both sides. I think actually Cilium. the problem comes down to, sorry, what are you saying, Taylor? I was just going to point out that Cilium actually has CapNet Raw turned on for some of its tests that are doing ICMP and other things that like that. Is I'm guessing that's just going to be a, a limitation. There's Is there anything in the works to make ICMP work without CapNet Raw? Well, I'm a little weird. ICMP doesn't work with it, with 
out to catnip rope because I can't send an ICMP packet, certainly. Mm -hmm. But, um, but you know, for instance, ICMP response will work just fine without it. You're really you saying couldn't... I can't call ping inside a container, I presume. Well, you couldn't respond to a ping. So if someone is pinging your yeah, container. That's happening, in the, that's happening in the next step. The container doesn't have to act for that to happen. I don't run ping, ping D on every server that responds to a ping. The kernel responds to a ping because it's a low level part of ICMP and IP in general. Mm -hmm. yeah, that may be accurate. I, I recall there being issues with, with the response, but that that might not be an issue anymore, mm -hmm. or it could just be the weirdness on the system that uh, that I was being shown on. So, it, 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 a question more generally. I mean, this sounds like it's gone the OpenStack way of nobody's really actually said a given. These are the responsibilities of whatever network stack you're doing. So. Is there such a thing? Is there a list of functionality that a CNI that considers itself to be a good actor is expected to stand up and implement? It, like it's very basic. It's incredibly yeah. basic. Like the requirements are basically uh, nodes can communicate with other nodes uh, where node is defined as something running a kubelet. Uh, nodes can talk to pods and pods can talk to pods and it's left it was purposely left uh, open to interpretation outside of that right so what we should probably consider is are we in the realm of undefined behavior when we want to do a certain thing because if we are in the realm of undefined behavior then uh, you can't do that thing in that way well it, it's definitely undefined behavior but uh, de facto standards have appeared and so it's, it, I, I think it's, it's not reasonable for us to go off and define what all those things are, but, in, but we know that in those set of standards, things like net, uh, net cap raw are set. Like there's nothing in Kubernetes that says it should or should not be set. And there's nothing that defines whether it should or should not be set. And so it's, it's left to the implementer of the CNI to work out and use their their reasoning to determine whether or not it should it, it should happen. So right. but that's what, what what I'm saying here is fine. I set capnet raw in my container and I send an MPLS packet. Um, if there is no documented responsibility of any given CNI to pass MPLS packets, which I think we can safely say there isn't, then I shouldn't expect setting capnet raw and sending an MPLS packet to do anything I might reasonably want to do. Yeah, and, and I see what you're saying there. Uh, the, the reality is we actually don't know what will happen on a per CI basis. And so um, that's something that we, sh we could call out to say that these things are, are not well defined. So you need, to, you need to state which CNIs you tested it with. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, that would be, I think the point I'm trying to get to, if you're asking for a specific CNI, by names or features or functionality, then we're doing something wrong, honestly, um, because either CNIs are defined to do what they do and not defined to do what you shouldn't expect, and we should not use anything that hasn't been defined, which fine, paints us into a corner, um, or alternatively, there's something that's not been written down here, um, that there is a subset of CNIs that implement a certain behavior that we should require right a not by name not by saying i will only work with cilium ideally but by saying i need a cni with this extension this this extra capability um sriv cnis for instance i hate the fact that they're a cni for the simple reason that i have absolutely no i mean they don't implement basic um cni functionality beyond the api they don't they don't behave like cnis are stated to behave but my point is that if what I'm looking for is something that doesn't behave like CNIs usually behave or are guaranteed to behave, then I need a way of expressing that. Yeah, and, and the contract for CNI is, is very simple. The problem that we're going to run into and that we already have run into is the same as in, in OpenStack. Like in OpenStack, the, 
uh, definition of what a, of what neutron could or could not do was uh, was very specific and similar to how CNI is like <laughs> we are IP based uh, thing, uh, networking. In OpenStack, we ran into a problem where OpenStack basically said we're layer two uh, slash no, layer no, three we networking. Didn't, we didn't. You, you need to be very careful about that. It, it defined absolutely nothing about how packets moved around. Well, but in the control plane, you still have to specify things like what MAC address it was being assigned and, and similar. It did not specify with the actual movement, but part of, part of what people did was they said, well, we're not using MAC addresses for this particular thing. So we'll go ahead and re reuse that field for something like MPLS. And eventually they added in a plugin system for it, but mm -hmm. uh, it definitely caused uh, cause pain. And then they worked out, oh, we could actually uh, don't even have to go through Neutron. We could actually just gain access to the RabbitMQ in the background and then completely bypass the APIs. So, which ended up causing a lot of issues around uh, around portability. Yeah, I, I, the point I was making was rather more basic than that because it always looked like from an addressing perspective, what you had was a bridge domain. Therefore, you might reasonably expect that things like broadcast would work and so on. But that was not the promise. In fact, the, the, the issue with the promise is it was different and it was in everybody's head. It was never actually written down. Um, sounds to me like the CNI, the promise is written down um, and we should read it and then we should refer to it. But we should make absolutely no assumptions about anything that hasn't been written into that promise, right? We certainly overstep the boundaries. We expect more than we're being offered. And I think that's understandable. I, I mean, it's just the way it is. But if what we're saying is that this CNF will work because it is emitting MPLS packets and the CNI will obviously do a certain thing with them, then that's, we're lying to ourselves. That definitely can't be a best practice. Yeah, and, and the CNI was designed specifically for one primary problem, which is how do I, how do I get a, contain, a container, how do I get an interface uh, set up in a, in a container? Uh, and interestingly, if you look at Kubernetes, it, the, there's no concept of a pod subnet in Kubernetes. There is mm -hmm. a service subnet, but there is not a pod subnet. So even the concept of like the fact that there are pod subnets is a construct of the, of the CNI implementation. So it, it's literally what is the interface and what is the IP address specifically layer three I, IP? I, I, I would, I would go through that system. actually. I don't think there's that likely to be anything in the CNI that says there's an interface. I think there's likely to be something in the CNI that ensures that every pod has an address of its own and that the CNI will make sure it can reach other things. But, you know, I could set up a pod with ECMP in it and I don't think I would be breaking any rules. Um, I, think it, I think it is bound to the kernel interface itself and it responds what the interface name is, but I could be wrong. It's been a long time since I've looked at uh, the specific portion of CNI, uh, but this is easy to check. The, the spec is, is trivial. Mm. Yeah, the reason I'm being ped pedantic here is because, you know, there's very little I can do, especially without privilege, coming back to where we started, there's very little I can do with a container interface name. Um, so knowing there is an interface, or even what it's called, or expecting to find an interface or any of these things, generally not, not relevant to, you know, applications that Kubernetes was intended to run. I do not need to know what the interface name is, or that there's one interface if I'm trying to run a web server. I, I have no interest in that. I want to know I've got one IP address, ideally, but that's probably all I'm asking for. I think one thing that's really confusing and also comical to me is how we seem to want to extend the functionality and add operators and CRGs for everything all over the place, except for like when it comes to the CNI and then everything has to be done through that context. Um, I mean, assuming that we had best practices that showed us how to do things intelligently and keep us out of trouble, like, I mean, lots of other people have found ways to put interfaces into pods, you know, in parallel to the CNI. But if it's storage, if it's something else, everybody's like, oh, I've got like 15 operators or all these different extensions that you can do, and we're just going to change the functionality of everything. But in networking, we're still going to shove everything into the CNI and try to recreate Neutron by just adding an infinite number of plugins. I don't quite understand why. We're so unwilling to add extensionality, ex extension, definitely not a word, um, extensions to the networking space, but we are everywhere else. Um, yeah, I mean, my concern here is one of pragmatism, not necessarily perfection. So what you could do is you could basically increase that CNI definition so that any CNI that's implemented that meets the standard 
of what a CNI is will definitely offer every bit of functionality that we need. And we all know that's unrealistic because that means that Calico, Multus and that one that somebody's writing in their garage that we haven't seen yet, all of a sudden have to do, you know, what 99% of people want to do. And then, you know, 90% of their code will be doing what this 1% of people do. That, that's not going to happen. Um, how the remainder of functionality is expressed, if you stick somehow to a CNI definition that everybody is willing to implement and implement properly, is an open question. I mean, clearly today, it's typically Multus and a bunch of other CNIs, um, is how we happen to have done it. Um, and we should live with the fact that that really is the best practice that we have. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's the only way, or indeed, if it's the best way that it could be done. Right, NSM demonstrates an alternative. There are probably others out there. Yeah, but I think we should be careful with this. I, like, I don't think we're going to get it scoped down, and the definition no. is too broad. The yet, yeah, in terms of being pragmatic, that means that you have to pick a CNI and you have to make sure that CNI supports the features you need and you test for it. And uh, uh, you, you need to pick a CNI, you need to make sure it's a version that supports the features you need, and you need the CNI developers to sign up supporting those features for some extended period as well. So we've got to be quite careful, even if we do that. Yeah, and uh, like in terms of the in, in terms of the CNI, there's also we also need to be careful in terms of interface versus capabilities and saying that the two are the same. So it was just something that came up early in the, the Multis days uh, when they were trying to work out how to how to position it and how to position the community is that like when they, they were trying to get multiple interfaces directly into the Kubernetes API itself and the people from Calico stepped forward and said, well, we don't want to be forced to implement multiple interfaces when we're just going to when we're just going to stick cross on the back of the of the current interface and. Uh, so that that concept of multiple interfaces to all CNIs, like CNI doesn't prevent you from starting multiple interfaces, but the implementers don't want to be forced to to do so. So that, that's what I was saying. Like it's it's important to take a look at the feature set that you that you want, and that feature set could include something like I not ignore the CNI part. The CNI is just about the interface. The CNI is not even running after uh, after the pod is uh, started. And so it, it comes down to the data plane that the CNI is attached to you. Will that data plane do the things that you that you want it to do? And will it respect some contract that you've uh, that you've organized with it? And there's no interface there in Kubernetes that uh, the beyond uh, you can speak to other pods, you can speak to other things, um, and the limited set of network policies they had they add in to go above they go beyond what those capabilities are. So it, it comes down to, to choosing that data plane and ensuring that you've tested against that data plane. Well, we're at the top of the hour. Hey, Ian, we're at the top of the hour. If we could f focus on what, what are some best practices, whether that's using CNI or using other things, the capabilities we want there and like best practice for using those. I think it would be a good focus for us. Not that you can't use a CNI, but what are the best practices and a use case that we can write up? Um, we got a lot of other content. We may have some other people next week or in the future from Red Hat on their testing that they've been doing in OpenShift. And if you have some other topics and add them to the upcoming uh, meeting notes. Thanks everyone. See you next week.